I welcome you all to this second day of the conference on development challenges in Africa in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. Yesterday, for those of you who were able to attend yesterday's sessions, we had insightful and fruitful discussions, largely focusing on the macroeconomic impact of the pandemic. So today we have two main sessions. The first session will focus on the impact of the pandemic on livelihoods and welfare. And the second session will be on the new normal and the future development of Africa. In this first session, we have three presentations. We are privileged to have three speakers because the first presentation is going to be made by two speakers who will be making these presentations. So the first presentation is on the effects of the pandemic on employment and earnings. And this will be made by Michael Dankwa and Simona Shota, who are both UNU wider researchers. The second presentation is on the mitigating role of tax and benefit rescue packages for poverty and inequality in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. This will be presented by Jesse Lastunen, who is also a UN wider researcher. And in total, we are, these two first presentations are actually based on the part of the ongoing research work at UN wider on COVID-19 pandemic. The third presentation will be on gender perspectives of COVID-19 pandemic. And this will be made by Isabella Schmidt, who is, a, uh, who is from UN, UN Women. Ladies and gentlemen, at this juncture, I would like to introduce to you all the, three, the four speakers that I've just mentioned. I'll start by Michael. Michael is a development economist and a research fellow at UNU WIDA currently serving as a focal point for the project on transforming informal work and livelihoods. Michael is also a visiting research fellow at the Transfer Project and a researcher for the International Growth Center, IGC, Ghana. Previously, he has worked at the Department of Economics at the University of Ghana. His research work has been published in several journals such as empirical economics, economic modeling, review of development economics, African development review, journal of international development, technological forecasting and social change among others. Michael has also been recognized as the most promising young scholar and the best researcher in the School of Social Sciences, University of Ghana. Welcome Michael. Michael will be making this presentation with Simona. Simona is an applied microeconomist with research interests in development and labor economics, working specifically at the interface of poverty, inequality, and employment dynamics research. Before joining UN WIDA, she worked at the German Institute for the Global and Area Studies and was a consultant to the World Bank. Simona's main research focus is on understanding the drivers and livelihood implications of transitions between different types of formal and informal work, as well as the interlinkage between occupational change and earnings inequality dynamics in developing countries. She has published in journals such as the World Development, Journal of Economic Inequality, Journal of Development Studies, among others. Welcome, Simona. Our third presenter this morning will be Jesse Lastnun, who is a research associate at UN WIDA, where his work focuses on tax benefits micro simulation models. He has previously worked for organizations such as OECD, RAND Corporation, Internet Association, and Technopolis Group conducting policy-oriented research on labor markets and emerging technologies. He received his PhD in policy analysis from Parda uh, Rand Graduate School with analytical focus 
in economics and quantitative methods. Welcome, Jesse. Last but not least is Isabella Schmidt, who is from UN Women. She has a PhD in international development, MPhil degree in urban and regional science, and, a, and, 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 and an MSc in human nutrition from Northwest University in South Africa. Prior to joining UN Women, she was the chief director of social statistics at Statistics South Africa for 10 years. Her primary responsibility was to oversee the production and promote the use of social statistics in South Africa. Prior to joining Statistics South Africa in 2008, she worked as an international consultant in Africa and in various uh, parts of uh, Middle East and also South Africa. Her specialization at that time was mainly on monitoring and evaluation of development projects. She has also worked in, uh, in other areas, in other countries like Sudan, Mozambique, Kenya, Uganda, Angola, Democratic Republic of Congo, Peru, and many others. And has been involved in food security and rural development projects. Welcome, Isabella. Now, with that introduction, I now like to do uh, to remind you about some basic housekeeping. So, we are going to have twenty minutes per presentation, and then after the three presentations, we shall have a Q and A session at the end of all the presentations. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. All right, M many thanks, uh, Marie, for the kind introductions here. Many thanks. So uh, let me first say that this paper falls under the UNU widest uh, tra tra transforming informal work and uh, livelihoods, you know, project. And the full working paper is actually available. So for those who would want to have access to that and then engage with us, you can find that on our web page. The authors of this paper is Simon. Simon is here with us. So I will do the, the first two or three uh, uh, you know, introductions, and then uh, Simone would take it up with the method, methodology and then the discussion of the results. And then Robert, Robert is at the, is at, you know, ESA. ESA is at the University of Ghana. And then Kunal is at UNU Wild. Next one, please. Right. So let, let, let me say that the, the COVID pandemic has posed a significant risk, not only for people's you know, health, but also to their economic well-being as well. One thing that is that has been that has been a common across many countries is workplace closures and then re restrictions on the movement of people as well. But these have actually affected the livelihoods of workers in particular across the globe. So what this paper the uh, you know, seeks to do is to provide a causal evidence on the impact of on the impact of a stringent lockdown policies on labor market outcomes and you know here we use Ghana as a case study and we look at how the covid pandemic and its related government measures 
i.e. lockdowns and other stringent measures have affected workers in Ghana. Then we also look at to what extent have workers been affected differently based on the type of government measures in place. So here we are looking at the government stringency measure in place, whether you know, a lockdown or, or not a lockdown or a partial lockdown. And then we also look at the type of activities that workers are engaged in. And here we pay much attention to the to the to the to the formality status. So we will look into formal, informal, and then informal self-employed, and then the informal wage, you know, employed as well. As well. All right. So before I, before we even go on, let me give you a bit of a background on how things unfolded in Ghana. So the the first cases was reported on the 12th of March 2020, and then from the 15th of March, the government began to roll out some of these stringency measures. So yes, uh, public gatherings and were banned, and then schools and universities were also closed. The borders were also closed as well. And then from the 30th of March, what actually happened was that there was a partial lockdown in what the government called the hot spots. So these were spots that were reporting very high numbers of what you call the daily infection rates. And these were greater Accra and then the, the greater Kumasi area. So there was a partial lockdown from the 20th of March to the 19th of April, where these particular locations were locked down, you know, to what you call it, restrict the movement of, um, of, uh, of, you know, of, you know, workers. So if you look at the figure that we have over there, one can see that, yes, right from the 12th of March, these stringency measures were, were you know, rolled up. And then from the 20th to the 19th of April, April, there, you know, one can see that the 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 astringency measure was very high, and then right after that, the measures were uh, 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 be, be, begin to go down here. And so, one thing that I can say is that yes, although now the 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 number of COVID cases have gone up. Ghana is reporting a, a daily rate of around 700, you know, but the stringency measures are, are not up to the, the state where we had the lockdown as well. Next slide, please. All right. So uh, one thing that is actually important to this work that we would present today is the data. So what, what we did with this paper was to work with, with the, you know, ESA. ESA is at the University of at the University of Ghana. ESA working with Northwestern University has what is called the Ghana Socioeconomic Panels Survey. And they have three rounds of that. Okay, the first round is in 2010. And then there's the 2014. Then the latest wave was in 2019. So we do draw from the latest wave, and then we conduct a you know rapid phone survey between the 19th of you know August up to the 17th of September 2020. In all, we 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 did we did have six. 170 re, re, re respondents in, 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 this, in, in this case. One thing that I would have to highlight here is that we were able to ask re retrospective 
questions regarding the, the, the COVID situation in February, when you know, uh, the, the whole thing started. And then in April, where there was the lockdown, and then in, then in September as well. So we were, we, we were able to get all, all these retrospective uh, questions. Which is which was very good for the work that we you know wanted to do. So based on this, we 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 we, we were able to identify the effect of the lockdowns, or the the what do you call it there the the partial lockdowns by comparing the labor market outcomes in areas with different uh, policy measures. Let me, let me I would would end here and then Simone would look at the methodology and then the discussion of the results and then we can come back and speak more to the paper. Simone. Okay. Great. Thank you, Michael, for the first part of the presentation and for setting the scene of this paper. So as you already explained, what we're doing is we compare the labor market outcomes of respondents who were located in districts that were subject to this partial lockdown, which we call the treated, and respondents located in districts where no lockdown had been implemented, which is our control group. So we're using what's called a difference in difference design here. And as already explained, we can draw on information from three time periods, essentially. So one is this recall from February 2020, which is the base period before COVID-19 had reached Ghana. Then we have April, which is the time that the partial lockdown was in place, which is our first post-treatment period. And then we have the time of the interview. So respondents were asked about the last seven days prior to the interviews that were conducted in August and September 2020, which is when most of the very most stringent policy measures had been relaxed. So this is our second post-treatment period. Um, just for completeness, here you see our the regression that we are estimating. So we control for location, lockdown and non-lockdown. Um, we have at the end this um, theta t is a time fixed effects for the different periods. And then we interact these two post-treatment periods with our lockdown measures. So this will be our main outcome variables of interest, where we see how respondents located in lockdown districts the treated fared compared to the control group. Um, given that we have information for the same individual for this three time periods, we also estimate an alternative specification where we in addition control for worker fixed effects. So there, um, the location as it, as we focus on people who didn't move. Um, the location is fixed, locked, so this lockdown drops, and then we still look at the treatment effects that we are interested in. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea of the study site that we are talking to, as Michael explained, the lockdown um, or the partial lockdown was of the two major metropolitan areas in Ghana. So we have Greater Accra and Greater Kumasi metropolitan districts and the contiguous districts that were under lockdown. So this is this left panel marked in red here. Uh, and then, of course, we had to take into account that those are the major urban centers. So they may be different in terms of infrastructure and so on. So we looked at the population density across districts, which is the second panel taken from the census, the latest census information. And what we did is to have a more comparable control group was through a set of um, population density cutoff at the lowest population density observed in the treated districts. So here in light blue, you see the other districts we surveyed and dark blue is a control group and red is a treatment group. And we can actually show that like time trends were more similar and comparable among this special control groups that we defined. And I'm going to show you the results for the broader group and for this limited control group. Um, just to give an idea of like the average demographic characteristics of the sample and um, to what extent these are similar across treated and control um, respondents. You see that about half of the respondents in our sample were female. The largest majority are heads of households, which was the target group 
of our sample selection. Um, something important that we noticed is that the household size tends to be smaller in treated districts or in lockdown districts compared to no lockdown districts. So this may imply that actually people moved out of the lockdown districts to those that were not under lockdown. And this is also what we see, like there's a larger share of people who moved since the last interview in those districts that were not under lockdown. And we add a robustness check to kind of control for this, to make sure this is not biasing any of our results. Um, then, as Michael explained, we focus on people who were actually working. So they were working in the last panel survey that was done in 2018, 2019. And most of those people were still working, at least in February 2020. So above 90% of our sample were working. Um, about 25% on average were in formal work and about 40% were, were in wage employment, uh, either formal or informal. Um, Yes, so this is a type of persons that we are talking about. Um, just as a general background, the, one of the first questions we asked people was what aspect of the coronavirus pandemic actually had the greatest impact on them personally. And about two out of three said that unemployment or loss of income was actually the largest concern. And this is surprisingly similar in both lockdown and non-lockdown areas. Um, we find some differences that people in lockdown areas were somewhat more um, concerned with restrictions on movements and with being sick or fear of getting sick, but there are not really any significant differences here. However, despite this general concern expressed by respondents in both locations, what we see is that the actual employment effect that materialized in April is very different between the two areas. So here on the left side, you see the share of respondents who were employed or reported to be still actively working in April 2020. And we see that in no lockdown districts, above 70% were still working, whereas in lockdown districts, it had dropped from close to 90% to 34% of the respondents. Um, so there's a sizable and statistically significant effect on the employment probability in April. And this is also confirmed by our regression analysis. So here, I don't show you the full table, just the main result of interest here. And as I said, the interesting part is this interaction term between lockdown and April. And what we find is that those located in lockdown districts had about a 35 percentage point lower chance of still being working in April 2020, in addition to the general drop that was observed, which is around 28 percentage points. So we can say that workers in lockdown areas were more than twice as likely to stop work in April when the lockdown was in place. Um, another thing we were wondering about is what were the reasons that people had to stop work? And actually most people said, or the very largest majority said that workplace or business closures due to government regulations were the main reason. And again, this is true both in lockdown and no lockdown areas. And as you may remember, also in the no lockdown areas, still confinement measures had been implemented um, just to a different degree, so to say. However, what we observe is that the type of workers who stopped work are significantly different in no lockdown versus lockdown districts. So in those where lockdown policies had been implemented, those workers who were able to continue work were largely in formal wage employment, which is kind of the most stable and secure type of employment um, that we identify. Um, whereas those who were most likely to stop work are those in informal self-employment, which has also by other studies been identified as the most vulnerable form of employment. So these are workers that are, for example, street vendors, um, who rely on making a living on a daily basis and who are often in very contact intensive jobs that were heavily affected by the lockdown. Um, on the other hand, as you can see in the no lockdown districts, this group was the one who was most likely to continue working given the need to make a living and to earn um, a living. Um, so in lockdown areas, more than or close to 80% of all informally self-employed had stopped work in April 2020, compared to only 28.3% in the non-lockdown areas. 
Um, and we also try to find a more fine-grained distinction within the informal sector, but we couldn't find any statistically significant differences there. Um, looking at the recovery, so this is now the time of the interview, or the last seven days prior to the interview that was conducted in August and September, we observe that most of the workers were back to be actually working. So about 86% of those in no lockdown areas and 84% of those in lockdown areas reported to be back in employment, to be in employment at the time of the interview. And here we observe at this point, no longer any statistically significant difference in the probability to be working between the two areas with, who had different, which had different policies in place. So this kind of effect that we had identified for the April period has vanished um, in August compared to April. Um, however, what it also implies that remember before we had like close to full employment, so the employment rates were clearly still lower compared to the February level. And we observed that 18% of all men and actually 29% of all women who had stopped, stopped working in April were still out of work in August and September. So this is why we do see a recovery. You also still observe an effect or a lower level of employment compared to February, though this difference between lockdown and no lockdown areas had disappeared at this point. Um, we try to see like what kind of factors were facilitating this recovery or which workers were more likely to return to work in time. And what we observe is that generally um, those who were on paid leave were quite likely to, uh, who said they had been on paid leave in April were quite likely to be again actively working at the time of the interview. Um, those who had said they had this layoff was only temporary um, were still out of employment, but those who said they had permanently stopped were the most likely to still be out of work at the time of the interview. So this perception of whether the layoff had been temporary or permanent actually also was visible in the recovery rates. And something interesting that we observed is that the interaction between lockdown areas and temporary stopping was actually positive. So those in the lockdown areas who said it was temporary were more likely to again return to work than those in the no lockdown areas. So this kind of recovery of those who had temporarily stopped because of the restrictions was stronger in those areas that had been subject to the lockdown policies. Um, yeah, as discussed before, we still observe that employment was lower. So here we just look at the more near term effect between February 2020 and the time of the interview. And what we see is that at the time of the interview, still employment was about 11.6 percentage points lower than it had been in February, but also we observe a statistically significant effect on earnings and on um, working hours. So earnings were still about 36% below what they had been in February and working hours were about 14.3% lower than what they had been in February 2020. So there's a persistent long-term effect on labor market outcomes of the pandemic, which though doesn't seem to vary by the policies that had been implemented or the stringency level of the policies. And um, just as a last note, um, this long term or this near term effect was more pronounced for those in self employment and for women actually. So those remained heavily affected in the medium term. Um, as I said, we do a number of robustness checks. So we look, we first check that the no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm supporting um, a conference. Um, oh, that's a common trend assumption underlying the difference in distance design oh, is actually um, confirmed. Then we check for self selection, as I mentioned in the beginning. So we distinguish or we take out people who moved, um, also finding the same patterns, and we also exclude the major metropolitan districts, um, so the very city center of Accra and Kumasi, to make sure that those are not driving our results. Let me quickly summarize. So 
what we do is we provide causal evidence of the impact of strengthened lockdown policies on labor market outcomes, making use of the specific policy settings that actually allows us to identify the causal effect. Um, what we find is that the lockdown measures implemented heavily affected economic activity and that the shock was felt the most by workers in the most vulnerable forms of employment. Um, so specifically workers in informal self-employment who are the most in need to earn a living on a daily basis were most often forced to stop their activities during the lockdown, while those in more stable formal employment were most likely to continue. Um, overall, there has been a strong recovery in employment up to August or September 2020, even though employment levels, working hours and earnings remain significantly below the pre-COVID level. So that's a persistent effect. And this effect has been more felt by those in self-employment and by women. And from this, we conclude that the COVID-19 pandemic and the related government response measures tend to have accentuated existing vulnerabilities in the Ghana labor market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone and Michael. Let's have the next presentation, please. So you have 20 minutes. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I hope everybody can see this. Um, and yeah, thanks, Simone and Michael, too, for the previous presentation. Very interesting work. Um, so my name is Jesse Lastunen. I'm a research associate at UNU Wider. Uh, this presentation is about our paper to the rescue, where we are looking at the effects of COVID in a few African countries using microsimulation. Um, one thing I want to note first is that, is that the work I'm presenting actually comes from a collaboration of more than 30 people around the world. So we are a, a pretty large group. Um, another thing is that uh, the work uh, I'm showing is currently in progress. And so some of the results I'll be showing are kind of preliminary and there's a lot more analysis to come. So I'll talk a little bit about our next steps of our work at the end of the presentation. Um, so first, some quick background. So this study is being conducted as part of the SaltMod Research Project uh, at UNU Wider. Uh, in the SaltMod uh, Research Project, our main focus is on developing tax benefit microsimulation models for developing countries. For those not familiar with these models, uh, I've list listed here a few of their uses. So microsimulation can be used to get uh, information on who pays taxes, how much do they pay in taxes, and also who receives benefits, uh, how different taxes and benefits uh, affect the government budget. And we can also estimate the distributional impacts of uh, changes in taxes and benefits, for instance, different uh, social protection reforms. Uh, another thing to note is that our work in the SaltMod group is very collaborative. As I mentioned, we are a big group. Uh, we work with research teams uh, from different partner countries as well as organizations like uh, SASPRI and the University of uh, Essex listed here. We also have a big focus on capacity building, basically organizing workshops and training sessions for you know, people to learn to use our models. And one heavy focus since this summer has been the COVID study that I will be talking about uh, in this presentation. So we are studying the effects of the pandemic on inequality and poverty in, in the six African countries listed here. There are also two non-African countries, Ecuador and Vietnam, that are part of the study. In the case of Ecuador, we have actually just published a working paper on the short-term effects of, of COVID-19 uh, in Ecuador. And I'll be, I'll be sharing the link with you later. Um, so here's more background on the study itself, specifically the, the part that focuses on the African countries. So our ongoing work covers the six countries mentioned in a previous slide. Uh, of course, these are all developing countries that are quite vulnerable to the pandemic, for instance, compared to many Western countries. Uh, quite clearly, there are pretty high risks to livelihoods and potential for increases in poverty, especially if the, if the pandemic is not uh, managed effectively. And so for all of these countries, we use the dedicated microsimulation models I mentioned earlier. And each of these countries has a single national model that we kind of, we are co constantly updating, improving in collaboration with the national teams uh, in each country. And that's actually one of the very useful dimensions uh, of this project, uh, that we can actually leverage the knowledge of these local research teams we have uh, in different countries, including in Africa. And overall, uh, when it comes to the COVID research, for instance, these teams have been you know, quite heavily involved in the, in the research process. Uh, 
In terms of the work itself, we have essentially two main study objectives. So for each country, we estimate first the effects of the pandemic and related lockdown measures on poverty and inequality. And second, we also analyze the contribution of these new COVID-related tax and benefit policies in mitigating these uh, negative impacts. Um, the microsimulation models allow us to look at outcomes for different groups in the population, basically different parts of the income distribution, different, uh, different demographics, uh, informal and formal workers, and, and so on. Um, so next here are our methods or kind of the main steps in the analysis. Um, firstly, we develop so-called pre-crisis data sets for, for 2020, which we use as a counterfactual. So these data sets allow us to obtain uh, scenarios in the models that show how economic outcomes would have looked like uh, in the absence of COVID in each country. And uh, we developed these data sets using the newest survey data available, usually from 2014 to 2018, but weighting this data so that it matches with population estimates for 2020. Um, secondly, we develop so-called crisis data sets that do account for the effects of COVID uh, last year. Um, this means taking account, in, taking account the uh, effects of lockdown measures and restrictions, which mostly reduced economic activity in these countries. Um, I won't go into the methods here in detail, but uh, at the moment we are, we are using World Bank's pre-crisis and crisis demand predictions to estimate firstly how different industries were affected by COVID and we then reduce individual incomes uh, within industries kind of accordingly. Um, thirdly, we compile information on different uh, tax benefit policies that were introduced in response to COVID and then include these changes into the models uh, when possible. And finally, we use the pre-crisis and crisis data sets and also the new policies in the micro, in the micro simulation models to uh, ultimately estimate the distributional effects of the pandemic and uh, of the different policies. Um, so if you look at the final step in more detail, what we do in a nutshell is to run the modeling scenarios uh, with and without the shock from the pandemic and with and without uh, different policies in place. And by doing this, we can answer a range of uh, different questions. For instance, uh, how much incomes and poverty would have changed uh, without any government intervention, um, to what extent do these normal tax and benefit policies help mitigate the shock from COVID, and also how much additional relief is offered by the new tax and benefit measures uh, that were implemented specifically in response to COVID. So here's the list of methods again. Next, I'll be talking about uh, essentially what we have found so far across these different steps. So some early results. Um, if we start with the crisis data sets, the big, quest the big question here is, you know, how the lockdown measures and restrictions actually affect different industries and individual incomes uh, in these countries uh, we are looking at. So as I briefly mentioned, we started by using World Bank's estimates to get some information on how industry level GDP or output was affected by COVID. Uh, here are the preliminary estimates from each country. You can see that, uh, for instance, South Africa, that's on the left, had pretty large impacts uh, across different sectors, ranging from 10 to 20 percent, uh, while countries like Tanzania and Zambia on the right were a little bit less uh, affected. Also, you can see that there's quite a bit of variation in the effects between different sectors. But again, these are just uh, kind of preliminary estimates using aggregate level data, uh, and we are working on kind of improving, improving these estimates uh, going forward. Uh, anyway, given these uh, industry level reductions in GDP, next we want to translate them to changes at the individual level. Um, and this is kind of the step required to actually compile the so-called crisis data sets. And I'll show you uh, quickly how we do this using as an example, this 14% reduction in GDP in the construction sector in Zambia, just as, uh, as an example. So first, we assume that labor income in the construction sector is reduced in proportion to this GDP shock. And this means that overall, the sum of wages will be 14% lower compared to the pre-crisis situation. Um, secondly, we assign randomly selected workers in that sector to unemployment with zero income, so that the total labor income in the sector is reduced by 14%. Uh, 
then we basically do this for randomly selected workers within all industries and all countries that experience a negative uh, GDP shock. And finally, based on the income reductions, we also adjust uh, household level expenditures or consumption uh, of the affected workers. And this involves some extra steps uh, I, will, I won't go through here. So uh, going back to the list of steps in the analysis, the next stage is uh, actually gathering some information on the tax and benefit policies in each country. So um, firstly, in addition to kind of updating any existing tax benefit policies in the models for 2020, we also identified and models policies specifically related to COVID-19 in each country with the help of our national teams uh, in, in the different countries. Uh, and here are just a few examples. Uh, for instance, in Mozambique and Ghana, uh, utility fees were reduced or weight for consumers for the rest of 2020, uh, soon after the pandemic started. Uh, Tanzania instead has provided informal support, for instance, to hospitals and orphanage centers, along with related uh, tax exemptions. And finally, one policy for which we actually have some results that I'll share with you later, is the emergency social gas transfer in Zambia. And uh, this was provided to specific poor households that are already receiving social gas transfers. Uh, it's around 20 US dollars per month per household for a period of six months total last year. Um, so yeah, these are just a few examples of the COVID related uh, policies enacted in the different countries in our study. Then if we move back to the list of steps, um, I'll move on to some early results from the actual uh, micro, -simula micro simulation stage. But before that, just a few reservations I want to mention here. Uh, one is that poverty results we have are based on national poverty lines and national equivalent scales. Uh, and this means that currently the findings related to poverty are not comparable uh, between countries. Uh, the final comparative paper that we are working on now, however, will use a harmonized poverty line and harmonized uh, equivalent, equivalent scale. Uh, you also saw the industry level shock estimates we have had uh, across countries and how we obtain individual income changes based on these shocks. Uh, there are some limitations with these methods that affect and basically limitations with the data that affect the accuracy of the results, possibly underestimating the shock a little bit. And obviously, we, have, we are working with um, pretty limited data, at least uh, 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 since last summer. Uh, however, especially over the past few months, we've been kind of lucky enough to get some new, more detailed data from many of these African countries we are looking at. Uh, for instance, World Bank has collected uh, individual level survey data on the effects of COVID specifically um, on employment and incomes in at least Uganda and Tanzania for now. And we are currently in the process of using this data to kind of better understand what types of workers are affected and also how they are affected. So, uh, for instance, how many people lose their employment and incomes in full as, as opposed to losing only a part of their uh, income as a result of the, of the pandemic. Um, but OK, finally, some preliminary results. Uh, I'll show you two types of outcomes. Uh, first, increases in consumption based poverty and inequality due to COVID and then also uh, a decomposition of changes in household incomes into effects in different parts of the income distribution and also for different types of workers, for instance, informal and formal uh, workers, similarly to the last presentation, actually. Um, so here are the results for Tanzania first. Uh, this is showing changes in inequality and poverty in 2020 uh, due to COVID, kind of based on our modeling and the assumptions uh, we've made so far. Uh, as you can see, there seems to be a very small impact on in inequality, both the Gini coefficient uh, and the ratio of income in the 18th percentile, 18 percentile of households compared to the 20th percentile. Uh, impacts on poverty were a bit larger based on our estimates. Uh, the first row under the poverty title, for instance, shows the poverty rate, uh, FGT0, and you can see that the poverty rate has actually increased by 2.2 percentage points. Uh, due to COVID based on our, our analysis. Um, here are some decomposition results. Uh, first, uh, this one shows the reduction of disposable household income in different quartiles of households. The gray bar on the left, for instance, shows the average impact on the poorest 25% of households. Uh, 
Quite clearly, however, incomes have uh, decreased the most in the middle of the income distribution by around 4.5% uh, essentially. Um, another finding is that automatic stabilizers, uh, that's the blue small bar you can see uh, on the right, uh, they, they've had a very limited impact in terms of kind of all alleviating these income losses due to COVID. Uh, basically only in the top quartile households have kind of paid slightly less taxes, uh, less social insurance contributions because of these earnings losses due to COVID. Um, here's this uh, figure again, but it's not, it now shows the income losses, losses separately for different types of workers. Uh, for instance, you can see that much of the losses are concentrated on informal employees, especially farmers, which is shown in the light blue bars at the bottom, and also for other informal workers shown in the kind of lighter gray bars there. Um, so to save time for Mozambique and Zambia, I will only show these tables with uh, consumption-based results, uh, consumption-based changes in inequality and poverty. Uh, I'm showing Mozambique simply because it's uh, essentially the most affected country in our study so far. So because of COVID, the Gini coefficient, for instance, increased last year from a bit over 0.5 to almost 0.8, uh, which is pretty huge. And similarly, the poverty rate uh, was substantially larger than it would have been without the pandemic. Um, finally, here is Zambia, for which we also modeled the emergency gas transfer I mentioned earlier. Uh, this one shows the total change that also includes the kind of compensating positive effects of this new gas transfer. Um, and the changes in inequality were not huge, but still noticeable. But especially if you look at poverty, you can see that poverty rate has increased from 41.5% to 48.8%, which is uh, pretty huge. Um, However, these increases in inequality and poverty would have been slightly larger without the gas transfer. For instance, you can see that the poverty rate was reduced by 0.3 percentage points because of this transfer. Um, and while it's not shown here, the effect of the policy was particularly large at the very bottom of the income distribution. Uh, for the poorest 10% of households, the negative impact of the pandemic was basically fully compensated uh, by this gas transfer. Um, okay, so just to uh, kind of summarize, um, we found modest increases in consumption-based inequality and a little bit larger growth uh, in poverty. Um, in Mozambique, especially, the impact of the pandemic was quite large uh, and the economic burden fell quite uh, substantially on farmers in the informal sector. Um, then again, uh, countries like Zambia seem to be doing a decent job, at least in protecting you know, some of the poorest households. Uh, from the economic shock. Uh, unfortunately, in many other countries, we are looking at these types of policies either were not implemented or were of a uh, very small scale. And finally, you know, automatic stabilizers in Africa, at least the countries we are looking at are, you know, quite limited in reducing the economic burden uh, from the pandemic. And this brings us to the next steps uh, in the study. Uh, my last slide, I believe, um, the first one is that we are really moving towards using microdata to improve our estimates of the shocks from COVID and also to improve the estimates of kind of the specific labor market transitions that took place in some of these countries. Uh, secondly, we are still in the process of modeling some policies similar to the emergency gas transfer uh, in the remaining countries other than Zambia. Uh, thirdly, one big benefit of these microsimulation models is that we are able to model alternative policy, basically experiment with social protection reforms and tax reforms that kind of could have been enacted and possibly could have been more cost effective than policies uh, already in place. And kind of this relates to the last point, uh, which is, you know, the one of the bigger, bigger goals in our study is to eventually also communicate these results to other researchers, but also policymakers and public officials. Um, so that's the presentation. I'll leave you with some links here. For instance, uh, there's the working paper on the effects of the pandemic and Ecuador, uh, and also our recent blog post discussing the early stages of this work. Uh, the link at the bottom might be helpful if you are interested in actually using these models yourself. Um, so yeah, that's it. You can also contact me at yes at uh, wider.unu.edu. I'm happy to answer any questions there or at the end of the uh, seminar here.
So thanks. Thank you very much, Desa. So next presentation is by Isabella. Isabella, please, it's your time. So I'm the Regional Gender Statistics Specialist for UN Women. And uh, we are going to share with you findings of a recent CATI survey that we did across the region um, to establish what the impacts of COVID-19 has been on women and men. So I'm basically going to share the findings of, of this study. And as you all know that due to lockdown restrictions, et cetera, we could not use conventional data collection methods. Um, and what we tried to do between September and November of last year was to um, reach out through two service providers, Geopol and Ipsos, to a representative sample of women and men, demographically representative, and of course limited to those who had mobile phones um, with phone call um, initiatives. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so our target population were generally 18 years and plus, adult women and men. And we covered not only Ethiopia, but South Africa, Kenya, Mozambique, Zim, um, Malawi. And we are currently busy with Iswatini, but that data is not available yet. We basically use two survey instruments um, because of the time limitations on an interview. Longer than 15 minutes on a phone call leads to respondent fatigue. Um, and our first questionnaire covered demographics, economic activities, agriculture, and education. And our second questionnaire included, again, some of the key demographic variables, but then focused primarily on questions dealing with health, human rights, safety, security, and GBV. We tried to do a demographic panel in that in the uh, respondents who were selected for the first interview were encouraged to continue to the second interview. And in most countries, we succeeded between six, to, to retain between 60 and 70% of the original originally sampled individuals. Um, the ones who were not willing to do the second interview were then replaced with someone who had similar demographic characteristics um, as per the quotas that we um, determined prior to, this, to the survey. Our sample size was 2,400 women and men. And because generally the sex distribution in countries is about 50%, we interviewed 1,200 women and 1,200 men. Next sample, oh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, most of the, all, all the service provider used random direct dialing, and that is uh, really our main claim to random selection. Um, but in some countries, certain quotas, which we determined previously using National Statistical Office data, uh, could not was difficult to fulfill. For example, older women living in rural areas generally do not have phones. And so to fill those quotas, we, we sometimes had problems and then we reverted back to existing databases that may include women of that particular age group. For It's just an example. But I've, I would say that 95% of our respondents were obtained via random direct dialing. We can go to the next slide. Um, so one thing that we did specifically in terms of methodology was in Ethiopia, we tested specific methodological aspects around gender-based violence. As you know, survivors of gender-based violence are quite often um, traumatized by questions related to gender-based violence. We also know that sometimes the perpetrators may be present in the household. And if, for example, speaker phones are used, it may have implications for the women being interviewed. And so we test a few things around that. Um, I can just say that the, the results of our testing are available in a technical report on the web. 
but we basically found that um, it will be important to have a question that looks at whether a speakerphone is being used during the interview or not. And the interview should be terminated if it's clear that there's an, um, a speakerphone being used. A second aspect that we tested was whether it makes a difference whether the interview is being conducted by a man or a woman when a man or a woman is interviewed. So gender matching or sex matching during the interview. And we found that for most gender-based violence questions, it didn't make a difference. But there were a few where there was a marginal but not statistically significant difference. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I think the technical report is available on our website and anybody who's interested in more detailed information about these specific tests we did are welcome to approach it. So <clears throat> in most of this presentation, I'm actually going to present the data of the, um, the, the uh, rapid gender assessment that we did using CATI. But in some instances, uh, data will be sourced from other uh, sources and there it will be indicated. So what we do know uh, related to gender and COVID-19 is that there is a sex dimension. Um, and even though it varies between countries, generally men are more likely to die than women. We also know that there's an age dimension, older people more likely to be infected and die than younger people. But when you look at this distribution on the screen, you'll notice that in South Africa, for example, uh, there's nearly a 50-50% uh, a 50-50 um, ratio between women and men. And that is primarily because of the presence of comorbidities such as obesity um, and also um, diabetes, HIV and AIDS that influence uh, the mortality rates in South Africa in terms of the distribution by sex. So when we look at the demographic consequences, uh, we would see that yes, clearly these mortality and morbidity consequences. In most countries, the number of deaths are relatively small and it's unlikely to influence the demographic profiles of those countries. However, we may see a surge in fertility rates due to out of school pregnancies and restricted access to family planning services during the, the pandemic. So that will have an, a, a, a demographic impact. In terms of the age structure, I already mentioned that um, for, for most countries, it's unlikely to have a big impact. In South Africa, it may have an impact because it has a relatively older population than the rest of the countries in the region. And we do know that some of the theories around why COVID uh, rates are lower in our region is because of our relatively young population structures. We expect, I think the two previous speakers spoke about the economic impacts of the pandemic, and we expect that there may be an impact on migration. We know that women in refugee camps are more vulnerable than elsewhere. We also know that when men migrate, women left behind suffer particularly challenges in many of the countries in the region. Next slide. Looking at governance issues around gender and, and women economic empowerment, etc., there are several uh, regional and global rankings uh, that are done in, through in the indices, but now we're specifically looking at the World Economic Forum 2020 Global Gender Gap Report. And that's particularly in relation to a gender sensitive legal and regulatory frameworks. And even before COVID, you will see that there's a substantial difference between countries in the region. Um, where our rankings, uh, globally, which is the blue bars, and our rankings regionally, which is sub-Saharan Africa, is the black bar. You'll notice that in terms of those frameworks, there were big differences between countries, with Mauritius um, being the lowest ranked in the region and Rwanda the highest ranked, both globally and, and regionally. Namibia and South Africa also did well, but Kenya and Mauritius uh, clearly need some work. And so within that context, uh, we see the pandemic happening. And we know that 
these frameworks are not accommodative of women even before COVID. So we expect more impacts in countries that did not have good frameworks. Next one. Okay, so during the pandemic, uh, we did some analysis with UNDP in our COVID-19 uh, global gender response tracker. And we found for the countries for which information was available, that uh, there was also really a varied response. And when you look at the lightest blue bar and the second lightest blue bar on the far right for every country, you'll notice that the areas that were most, or the area that was most likely to have um, interventions put in place is violence against women. And then the total gender response me uh, measures, which is the far right column, uh, we noticed that Uganda and South Africa was the most likely of all the countries in East and Southern Africa to implement significant numbers of specific uh, gender interventions or normative frameworks during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's do the next one, please. So in terms of socioeconomic consideration, we also did some modeling uh, about the percentage of women and men living in extreme poverty. Now, this slide is unfortunately very, very busy, but I think if you can focus at the darkest blue bar, that gives you the percentage of women that have been projected to be living in poverty during 2020 as a result of the COVID pandemic. And the second darkest bar represents the men. And I think what's really important in this graph is to see that there's been disparities even before COVID between women and men living in extreme poverty. And so moving into COVID, those gaps increased between women and men. And we can also see that, yes, there will definitely be a significant impact on both women and men, but more so for women as a result of the COVID pandemic. Let's go to the next slide. So here we are looking at um, the findings of our CATI survey that was conducted in several countries in the region. And it suggests that most women and men have reduced individual as well as household income, varies between countries, but generally men were more affected than women. women workers in the formal sector were more likely to change the economic activities due to COVID-19 than any other sector. And the percentage of employed and not economically active uh, individuals increased more so for women than for men. So in general, we also find that the social security assistance network provided by governments and other agencies reached very few individuals. The only um, uh, country where it reached significant percentages of people was South Africa, where they um, rolled out the 400, uh, 500 billion US dollar support um, package. We also found that the remittances that were received prior to the pandemic decreased uh, during the pandemic. So all across the available money for social support decreased. Then um, the biggest source of worries for women uh, have been becoming infected with the virus, but for men, concerns about economic activity and income were the most important. Let's go to the next one. Um, okay, so changes in personal incomes during the pandemic, here are the percentages, and we see that um, individuals who lost all personal income is the dark blue, those who indicated that their incomes have decreased or downsized are the, the black ones. Generally, a country on the left will be the percentage of women affected, and the second bar will be the percentage of men affected. So, for example, you'll see in Ethiopia, 61.4% of women had decreased downsized um, incomes and 64.1% of men. And so you can just go through all the countries uh, indicated here. Uh, and you'll see that in most countries, the percentages who have downsized um, or lost their incomes are sort of higher in all countries except or than in South Africa. But in South Africa, a much bigger portion said that they lost all their personal incomes. Go to the next uh, slide, please. Okay, so financial difficulties and decreases in combined household incomes. 
Here we see that women and men reported generally whether the combined incomes of their households increased or decreased, and these are actually decreases. Um, so on the left, dark bar for women would be a percentage who experienced financial difficulties during the pandemic. Light blue bar for women and men would mean um, it's a percentage where the combined income of all household members has decreased. And that, so you see the impact has been big across the region. Kenya, quite big, Mozambique, uh, high. Uh, I think the previous speaker also said that they felt that there was a bigger impact in Mozambique than elsewhere. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so here we just look at changes uh, in the sector, economic sector in which you were involved in. Dark blue, work for someone else, uh, or organization or a government. Um, next uh, color is own account worker. Next one is worker in agriculture. Uh, next one is not employed or unemployed. And then we have other activities. And then you'll see everything registered as negative means that the percentage of, of individuals who said they worked for someone else decreased by so many percentage points um, between March 2020, which was our base before the pandemic was declared, um, until the period we were collecting data, which was between September and November of 2020. So basically, we are looking at a period of about um, six months and our survey intervention took place immediately after um, we had significant um, lockdowns and movement restrictions being lifted. Let's go to the next one. Okay, and so um, when we look at time use, I'm not going to do my whole presentation because I think everybody took a bit longer than we needed to. And what's important is that we also engage with the audience and have some discussions. So I'm going to quickly go through this. We regard unpaid domestic and care work extremely important. And within the pandemic context, we know that um, women and men have been affected uh, by additional domestic and care work within households. So the burden of care increased, um, especially during lockdown. And it's important from a women economics empowerment and sustainable development perspective because it basically prevents women from fully participating in the in the economy let's go to the next slide so um, what we found and I'm not going to go through all the details in reading in, in reading all the data but before the pandemic they were already a significant burden on women and this represents our findings where women the percentage of women who say they were mainly responsible for these duties before the pandemic. Let's go to the next slide. We also now see the unpaid care activities. Um, so here we also see exactly that there's been a spread of increases uh, or, or basically a load on women for unpaid care work prior to the pandemic. If we go to the next slide. We'll see the, the time spent on unpaid domestic work has increased. So here we see women and men compared. And actually in most countries, more than 50% of women and men all said that their unpaid care duties increased during the pandemic. Let's go to the next slide. And this is care work. The previous one was domestic work. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so what's important for us is that we highlight the fact that women are prevented from full entry and participation in the um, economy because of their unpaid domestic and care activities. What we laud is during the pandemic, both men and women uh, have seen increased uh, activity levels, but the fact that men increasingly supported women during the pandemic is something that we can leverage in our continued advocacy efforts to um, promote the sharing of these tasks between women and, women and men, as well as making sure that there are policy measures that address this, such as the provision of childcare mechanisms that would enable women to be more economically active in the post-COVID recovery phase. Let's go to the next one. 
Um, I'm just going to briefly highlight what we think the impacts of the pandemic is on girls, uh, especially the school closures. And if you then focus on the second um, set of, of flows around school closure, you'll see that learning deteriorates, girls do additional housework and care work. Our data supports that this is true. But then you see disruptions in the school system, you see early pregnancies, you see loss of household income, and then girls being delegated with income earning um, uh, 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 tasks. But you see also increased risk of exposure to sexual exposure, exploitation and GBV. So girls are more at risk than boys. Uh, within the context of, of COVID-19 and the school closures. And if you go to the next slide, post-COVID, we believe that it will be very, very important to um, leverage some of these and, and pay attention specifically to, to the vulnerabilities that girls face during closure. We can now go on to the second last slide. Um, just so that I can finish up and we can have some time to discussions. If you can please move the slides. So here we have gender-based violence um, and we definitely found that most women and men in the areas where we did the survey felt that gender-based violence increased. Um, we need continued advocacy work around GBV prevention and services. Um, and so safe places, mechanisms and services for victims and survivors, all of those are important um, aspects that need uh, attention. We need uh, more data that's conducted with larger samples and that look at measuring the incidence of gender-based violence. And of course, there are all the issues around human rights uh, training uh, for, of the police and all the other agencies dealing with um, victims and survivors of rape and, and gender-based violence. So I thank you. And we will um, have a formal launch of a wider study than just uh, the data that I've just shared with you on the regional impacts of COVID-19 um, on gender equality in East and Southern Africa. We launched this during International Women's Day and I will share the program as well as the links with you in wider. So for those of you who are interested are welcome to attend the launch at that time. So now I'm handing over for a session uh, that will be discussing the findings of, of the three papers that were presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this time now to welcome you for your train A. Uh, from what I can see, we have some questions already from the participants directed to the presenters. So what I'll do is that I'll pick um, questions for each one of you, and then maybe we could have two questions, and then you have time to respond. And if time allows, we could uh, take another set of questions. So the first question goes to Jesse. And the question is, uh, the participant, this is uh, Nomena, would like to know how monetary policy can work coherently with the physical policy to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 and how you, you accounted this in your analysis. Whether you are that in your analysis. Right. Yeah. Thanks to Nomena for this question. Um, I'm definitely not an expert on monetary policy, uh, on the monetary policy response to COVID, especially in developing countries. Uh, the simple answer, I guess, is that uh, most likely in cases and in countries where there is a clear negative impact on aggregate demand and financial stability, monetary policy should become uh, looser, at least momentarily. Um, you know, lower interest rates, uh, maybe more relaxed capital and liquidity requirements for banks, for instance, uh, might be warranted. You know, ideally, these monetary policy changes would still be consistent with any mandate the country has of, you know, re regarding price stability, financial stability. Uh, something that complicates this, this kind of basic prescription a little bit is that uh, COVID has been uh, lastly, not just a demand shock, but also a supply side shock, which kind of uh, 
makes monetary policy less effective in these cases. And also there, there's been a relatively quick recovery in, in many countries, as we saw from the first paper in, in Ghana. Um, but again, you know, the circumstances differ between countries a lot, and I'm definitely not uh, the most qualified person to comment on this. Um, but um, that would be my thought. In, in our analysis, we basically, you know, tax benefit micro simulation models are about, uh, you know, uh, kind of static tax and benefit changes uh, and also income changes within the country. So monetary policy wasn't something that we directly took into account. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Thanks. Thank you very much. The next question is, uh, I hope that uh, that answers uh, the question to the participants, that is Nomena. The next question goes to Michael and Simon. Do the type of lockdown policy explain the changes in poverty and inequality across countries? And the question is, uh, the additional part of the question is that because some countries had minimum lockdown compared to others. So how would you account for that? Or how can you be able to explain whether the type of lockdown policy measures undertaken partly explains the changes in the poverty and inequality measures? Many, many thanks, Maureen, for, for, for this. Uh, in our paper, although we, we, we don't look at issues of poverty and what do you call it, in the inequality, but we can still speak to this uh, to some extent. Because what, what, what we actually find is that the areas where we had this partial lockdown, there was a significant negative effect on employment, just as uh, Simon sh showed. And this, and this was mainly on the informal self-employed. So definitely, if you have such a shock that leads to such a labor market outcome, you know, then definitely it would have some effect on the livelihoods of the people as well. So if you take most of the countries, let's say Ghana, you have more than 80% of the people working as, what do you call it, uh, working in the informal sector, per, per se. And these are the folks that were hard, you know, hit, you know, looking at the, 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 the work that we, you know, did. So, so yes, we don't work exactly on that, but one can look at it, looking at the very, uh, what do you uh, call it, uh, what do you call it, and the very ne negative uh, impact on, on the labor market outcomes. Thank you, Michael. And since you are still just on stage, could I also ask a question? Uh, I was wondering whether you took into consideration uh, the, the gender differences in the, the effect of the lockdown measures on employment and earnings. I, I, I saw some gender variable in your regression, but I'm not quite sure to what extent you took this into consideration. Yes, yeah, so, so Simon, okay. Yes, Simon would have a look at um, that. Yeah, thanks Maureen for the question. So yes, we did check for differences by gender by adding an interaction with the variable catching, capturing the gender of the respondent. And as I was showing, we saw that especially like in this more near term, medium term effect, we had a significant difference between males and females. So females were more likely to be still out of work even like five months after the lockdown had been implemented and their earnings were more negatively affected than those by men. So we do, do look at this and do find stronger effects for females. Thank you. So I uh, just uh, back to you, I, I, I think the, the person who was asked this question about the, whether the impact of, uh, or the type of um, lockdown measures explains changes in poverty and inequality would also like to you to respond because I think your presentation touched more on the 
on the changes in the poverty and inequality across countries. And we know that some countries like uh, maybe Tanzania didn't at all uh, have any lockdown measures. And how would that explain your inequality and poverty results? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Um, you know, our current approach basically relied on World Bank's demand data and it doesn't dis dis distinguish uh, between different explanations behind the economic shock. Uh, but the people, person who answer, ask, ask this is definitely right in that, you know, lockdown measures do not necessarily explain the adverse economic effects, including, you know, poverty increases. Uh, there are other reasons, um, for instance, you know, voluntary reduction of travel and consumption within the country, maybe reduced tourism, um, lower uh, demand for experts, exports in that country. So there are many, many possible reasons, but our current method doesn't kind of distinguish between these causes of the pandemic. So that's my simple answer to that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I had some question for Isabella. I mean, this is just like more of a comment. And I think it's, it's related to the same uh, issue of whether the types of lockdown or maybe the measures that have been taken. For example, I noticed that um, the countries like Kenya and Ethiopia were more affected in your presentation in terms of the, some of the outcomes. Would it be because uh, maybe these countries had more strict uh, lockdown or measures and how, uh, whether this has taken into consideration some of the uh, social protection measures that have been taken and whether these have been effective in uh, alleviating some of those gender differences? Yes, we actually definitely um, considered the, the, the lockdown measures in each country that were different. Uh, I think what all the countries had in common was that the survey data was collected when all international borders were open and uh, movement restrictions internally were um, reduced. I think what was in place in some countries like South Africa and Kenya was curfew, uh, was a curfew. Unfortunately, we, unlike the first study that was presented, we did not specifically collect data during different phases or compare areas with lockdown, without lockdown. Um, and so because the economic circumstances were different even prior to the study, we cannot attribute uh, the, ch the differences that we see to specific types of lockdown measures because the starting points were different. But I do think that um, the country where the lockdowns were the most severe, uh, the countries was, were actually Kenya and South Africa or in, in the region. And economic activities were severely uh, affected especially in the first two to three months of lockdown. So I think some of these uh, impacts that we, we see and differences between countries could, you know, inferentially be linked, but it's not scientifically um, associated. Thank you very much. Um, we still have more questions, actually. There are quite a number of them. I'll just pick them selectively. So please don't feel offended if I'm not able to pick on your question. We have a few minutes and I'll try to uh, pick just at randomly. This is directed to Michael and Simon. On the analysis of the impact of COVID on employment, were you able to take into account the extent of, uh, or the linkage with the the sectors, for example, to what extent, like maybe some sectors were able to either have um, fall, to act as fallback position in cushioning the, the impact, or whether there were variations uh, uh, across sectors like natural resources, agriculture, etc. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I mean, we 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 have. We, we have enough data on the sectors to be able to this, what do you call it, uh, aggregate, all right? And, and then look at some of these things that uh, that uh, Edward is raising. But, but, uh, but I'll let uh, Simon uh, come in, but we, we, we don't go to, to that, what do you call it, uh, extent. That, 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 that was not the, 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 what do you call it, the focus of this, Steady, and so we don't do the this aggregation that uh, 
he wants us to, but, but definitely we, we should be able to look at that given the data that we you know have. Yeah, maybe just um, thanks for the comment. And I think it's a suggestion to explore. Um, just on a note, like our sample focuses on workers in urban areas only because we look like those that were under lockdown were the major urban centers. So also the other like control districts where we did the survey are all urban. So we may not be able to speak to the sectors mentioned by Edward here, which are mainly agricultural kind of. So we, we have little information on the effect on agriculture in that sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this may be, uh, there's a comment here or a question that I think is directed because it applies to, I think, all, of, all, all the presentations. And the fact that uh, this, uh, uh, the results of, of, the, of the analysis is based on kind of a rapid survey that has been undertaken just after the COVID. Is there a possibility of embarking on another rapid survey or longer period that perhaps capture the effects on a prolonged period? which would also cover the second wave of COVID-19 that we are witnessing. Yes, 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 of course, but it takes money to do, do that. So, Senia, if uh, you would give us funding, we, we would hopefully do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 I mean, what I want to say is that, say that the, the what do you call it, the basis are there. We, we've done a lot of work to build this, what do you call it, the partnerships, and to get some of these work going. So, so the base is there. We can always, you know, expand on 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 on, on that. That's what I what, want to say. So, in my case, uh, you and women, we spent about five hundred thousand dollars on the study with partners like UNFPA, etc., who contributed as well. And fortunately, we won't have in the next six months um, resources to repeat the study. So we will do a global study on gender-based violence of, uh, in three countries in East Africa and three in West Africa, which will have a slight economic dimension because that's part of the demographic um, data collected. But yes, unfortunately we can't on the scale that we've done the previous one repeat it. I could maybe also add that um, the one survey that we will be using in the future will be the World Bank's uh, high frequency phone surveys on COVID-19 in, for instance, Uganda, Tanzania, and also they have the same, same types of surveys for other countries uh, as well. And I think that uh, survey will go on, uh, you know, it's still going on in 2021 and was going on uh, at the end of last year. So I think that's that's one survey that actually might give, uh, for many people, many researchers, interesting information on the effects of COVID, including also the second wave. Thank you. So uh, we, it's already 10.30, and uh, I, I'm afraid I have to, to uh, end the session because, so that we can have uh, adequate time for the next session. And I'd like to thank you all for a wonderful presentation and also for taking time to be with us. I'd like to thank the participants that are in this session. I now like to call the session to, uh, uh, to end the session and we have 15 minutes break before the next session on the new normal and the future development of Africa. Thank you all. <laughs>